Praise God, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this day, a great special day that the Lord has made. May we be able to rejoice and be glad in it. Our God is good and all the time because that's his nature. He's brought us this far. He's our God, he's our savior, and he's our friend. He who started a good work in us, I know that he'll bring it to its accomplishment. Glory and honor is his. I want to take this moment to welcome you into a session of Bible study, a session where our relationship with God is redefined. Happy Easter celebrations, a season when we are reminded of the sacrifice that was paid by Jesus Christ, his own life, that we may overcome sin, that we may overcome death. He gave us the strength, the power to defeat death, and the power to defeat death is on our tongues when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and walk in the ways of God, in the commandments of God, obeying his statutes, uh, that will give us an opportunity to stand tall against our enemies, against the plan of the evil one, against those who stand in our destinies, those, stand who, those who stand in our way against our salvation. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and are baptized and we become a new creation born by the Spirit, we are ready to take on the mantle against the enemy. We continue to reflect on this sacrifice. I encourage all of us during this season to focus on reading Gospel of John from chapter 13 up to the end. You will see the purpose for Easter very beautifully explained. And you will see the perfect gift that Jesus reveals, reveals to us before he's taken up, that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 16, his duty to us. And you'll see Jesus Christ in chapter 17, interceding for us who he lives here on earth, that we are protected against the evil one. Jesus understands and helps us to understand that our enemy, the adversary, will make an effort, but will not succeed. And Jesus also says that until now, or until the day he's taken away, nothing had been asked in his name. But he says that whatever we ask in his name, we shall receive. We thank God for giving us an opportunity to be able to associate with his goodness especially after we had been found unworthy from the sin of our grandfather, Adam, the first man. And it is that sin that we see messing up the world because of the flesh. He admitted the devil into our lives and he continues to claim that place, that legal right, until you destroy the covenant and that covenant can only be destroyed by Jesus Christ by his blood which cannot be compared with any kind of blood today we continue to do Bible study and we are doing uh, the reading of the book of Micah Micah a prophet after Amos during the reign of Jeroboam II, it was the reign of prosperity. Je Jeroboam II was the king of uh, Israel. 
he, he was a king that reigned over a period of prosperity in Israel. So we see that Micah is a prophet that followed prophet Amos, after which there was prophet Isaiah, and then later we saw the fall of Damascus, and the capture of Assyria, and the revolt of Judah's king Hezekiah, reign, I mean against Assyria, followed by the destruction of the cities of Judah, uh, sparing Jerusalem. Uh, his reign, his call was in 750 BC, and he reigned up to 686 BC. His call really was such a very long spell. Uh, this is about eighty. I'm sorry, about sixty-six years in ministry. Uh, his message revolves around uh, who God. Is like him being able to pardon iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage that he does not re retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy and we see this character of God reflected from the time of creation up to the end times. Creation of Adam and Eve, they fell short of God's glory when they disobeyed him, but even when he banished them out of his presence, he did not allow them to go naked. He closed them up and banished them and into I mean, out of the promised land into the world, they went through so much sin that God could have destroyed the whole earth, but he gave a chance to Noah and his family to relieve what he had planned and purposed for Adam and Eve, but they failed. And we see out of Noah we came, out of Noah Abraham came, the grandfather of all nations, and out of Abraham came Israel, and out of Israel came David, and out of David came Jesus Christ, and out of Jesus Christ came salvation and redemption for the world, an opportunity given individually to whoever believes that Jesus Christ is Lord to be saved, and it is those that are going to partake in eternity reigning together with Jesus on the throne and turning together with Almighty God and those who have had questions will have all of them answered in glory. Jesus Christ does not reign and rule on this kingdom. If you read the book of John during this season, you will understand that his kingdom is not here. His kingdom is to come and those who are to dwell in the kingdom will not dwell in this flesh. They will dwell in the body that will be given to them. Those that will rupture and those that will have gone before as saints joined together in that body will reign together in a place where we can commune with God, in the place where there will be no sin, in the place where there will never to be the devil. Brethren, we need to know that every word that God has said will come to pass. And yesterday, you know, in the message of the book of Amos, we learned that there is nothing that God does without first of all revealing it to the prophet. We know that God speaks through his people that he has anointed to speak on his behalf. And we know very well that the end times are going to come. It's just a waste of time ignoring the facts that are. But those who know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do great and mighty exploits. 
Mecca chapter 1, the word of the Lord that came to Mecca of Meresheth, Meresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, and which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Mecca saw, received prophecies for the two kingdoms, that is um, Samaria for Israel and Jerusalem for Judah. And we look at the coming of judgment of Israel. Hear all you peoples, listen, O earth and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread on the, tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split like wax before the fire, like waters powered down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. That is the transgression of Jacob. Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not in Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the field, places for planting a vineyard. I will pour down her stones into the valley, and I will uncover her foundations. All her caved images shall be beaten to pieces, and all her, and all her pay as a harrow shall be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of the harrow, and they shall return to the pay of a harrow. Mourning for, Jerusalem, for Israel and Judah. Therefore I will wail and howl. I'll go stripped and naked. I'll make a wailing like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. For her wounds are incurable, for it has come to Judah, it has come to the gate of my people to Jerusalem. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all in Beth Aphra. Roll yourself in the dust, pass by in naked shame, you inhabitants of Shepha, the inhabitant of Zanan, does not go out. Beth Ezel mourns. Its place to stand is taken away from you, for the inhabitant of Maroth pinned for good, but the disaster came down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem, O inhabitant of Lashish. Harness the chariot to the swift steeds. She was the beginning of the sin of the the sin to the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in you. Therefore you shall you shall give presents to Moresheth, Gath, the houses of Atzib shall be a light to the kings of Israel. I will yet bring an heir to you, O inhabitant of Maresha, the, the glory of Israel shall come to Adulam, make yourself bowed and cut off your hair because of your precious children. Enlarge your baldness like an eagle, for they shall go from you into captivity. God lays down the sin of the descendants of Jacob, how they had fallen short of God's goodness, and how they had fallen out of covenant, out of love with him, and had fallen in love with other gods, worshipped other idols, and how Israel had brought, had sinned, and their sin had extended to his land, to his children in Judah, how they had turned a place that he had chosen for himself to be worshipped in, that is Jerusalem into a place of worship of idols and he says please get down on your knees fall to the ground
put on sackcloth, pray and repent. But needless to say that the children of God were stubborn, their hearts were hardened, and they were not willing to obey the command of God. They were not willing to surrender to his goodness and live. Rather, they chose the path of death, the path of destruction. Brethren, it's important that as children of God, we take a moment to reflect and return to God's goodness. Learn from the children of God. We are living in end times and there is a true repeat of what happened before Jesus Christ, what happened in the land of Israel, what happened in the land of Judah. The church has become desolate. People go to church to show off. People no longer seek God. They seek men of God. There is no relationship between God and people anymore. But brethren, it is time for us to return to the true love. Read the word of God. Pray to God in truth and honesty. But most importantly, let us be able to go into a place of repentance and rebuild our relationship with God, walking in his commandments, honoring the sacrifice that Jesus made, and such that when the time comes, it finds us ready to overcome. It finds us in a good in a good place. Chapter two sends a warning to evildoers. Me and you that have done evil knowingly or unknowingly. This is a word to us, not to intimidate us, but to return us to a place of true repentance. Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and take them by violence. Also houses and seize them and seize them. So they oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against his family, I am devising a disaster, from which you cannot remove your necks, nor shall you walk notly. For this is the for this is an evil time. In that day one shall take up a proverb against you and lament you with a bitter lamentation, saying, We are utterly destroyed. He has changed the heritage of my people, how he has removed it from me. To a turn court he has divided our fields. Therefore you will have no one to determine boundaries by lot in the assembly of the Lord. A warning to the lying prophets, do not plateau, you say to those who prophesy, so they shall not prophesy to you, they shall not return insult for insult. You who are named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord restricted? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? Lately, my people have risen up as an enemy. You pull off the robe with the garment from those who trust you as they pass by. Like men turned from war, the women of my people you cast out from their present houses, their, from their present houses, from their children. You have taken away my glory forever. Arise and depart, for this is not your rest. Because it is defiled, it shall destroy, yes, with utter destruction. If a man should walk in a false spirit and speak a lie, saying, I will prophesy to you of wine and drink, even he would be the platter of his people. He also talks of Israel's restoration, and he says, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob, I'll surely gather the remnant 
or visual i'll put them together like sheep of the fold like a flock in the midst of their pasture they shall make a loud noise because of so many people the one who breaks open will come up before them they will break out pass through the gate and go out by it their king will pass before them with the lord at their head praise god brothers and sisters the lord is good and all the time because that's his nature he continues to reveal himself strong he continues to reveal his mighty power and his abundant grace and his blood surrounds us and his blood covers us and his blood enables us he comes against any power and any authority and any iniquity and he subdues and renders powerless any evil plans of wickedness let the blood of jesus take over and possess this place where we stand in his presence and give honor back to him uh, so we see the evildoers at it doing their worst but we also know that the devil has no right and has no place in the assembly of the lords so he gives an ultimatum and a warning to the lying prophets who have no spirit of god in them but the spirit of evil that lies and gives wrong prophecies but amidst all these he reassures the children of god of restoration imagine a god that gives a warning of destruction of disobedience but amidst all that he leaves room for restoration when i was reading this word i am i'm reminded that in my journey of salvation i've received messages similar to this in the middle of the storm you see bad dreams and you see good dreams you see dreams of destruction you also see dreams of hope and as i was reading this word i understood that god was telling me how me and my generations were heading my descendants sorry we are heading for destruction because of the sins that lived in our foundation but he also showed me that the, this the good side meaning that if i dealt with the sin that existed in my foundation then i would be able to tap into the rewards of obedience and i know very many people out there you have been praying to god but along the way you see attacks in your spiritual realm along the way you see battles that you have to fight and i say to you brethren that god is telling us like he told the children of israel repent and live but refuse and die so he shows you the causes of your death if you do not repent but if you see this and you repent and deal with that evil you will see the evil being destroyed and you'll start walking in the life of victory and you'll start walking into your destiny. Chapter 3 continues to talk about the wicked rulers and the prophets. And he says, And I said, Hear all, hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh in the cadron. They, then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds thus says the lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray who chant peace while they chew with their teeth but they prepare war against him who puts nothing into their mouth therefore you shall have night without vision 
and you shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob, and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice, and pervert all iniquity, who build up Zion with bloodshed, and Jerusalem with iniquity, her heads judge for, for a bribe, her priests teach for a pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm come upon us. Therefore, because of Zion shall be plowed like a field, Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountains of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Brother and sister, we learn that when the children of God sought for a king in favor of their God who ruled over them and took them successfully from Egypt and gave them their promised land and gave them judges to defend them, they were signing out for their power into the hands of their king. And so when the kings sinned, the children of God were punished for it. Now, we have the kings that were so wicked going through so much evil, living like meat for the pot and like flesh in the cauldron, um, living in a world that was not worthy of God. And then the people would cry to the Lord, but he would not hear them because that that that, that um, fallen so deep into sin, and he would even hide his face from them because they were not seeking him from a good place; they were seeking him from the place of sin, because of the evil in their deeds. And so God, uh, they had prophets among them, but they were looking out for their own interests. The kings were looking out for their own interests. They hated good and did and loved evil. And so, uh, even though they sought God, God would not come through for them. Instead, he told them to prepare for war. And then, um, the more the prophets sought God, the more they could not find him. The more they, they sought his mighty hand, the more they sank into deep frustration. And so the Lord says, he is full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. And so he says to the rulers of the house of Israel who were full of iniquity, abhorring justice and perverting equity, who had built Zion on bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity, who judged for a bribe and priests taught for a pay and prophets divined for money. And yet they would lie, lean on God and say he was among them and that they would lie to people that no harm would come to them. Remember the time of Jeremiah? Prophets are told people, no, destruction was not coming. And Jeremiah, who was standing on the right side of God, instead went through so much torture 
imprisonment, threat of death, because you are standing on the truth against the prophets that told the children of God things they wanted to hear. And so God was telling them that Zion shall be destroyed and Jerusalem would become a heap of ruins and the mountain, the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest because everyone had lost it. And when we look at what's happening today, how the church of God is being bashed, how men and women of God have become a source of inspiration to comedians. What do you think? You, a child of God, seeking God's presence. It is time for us to go back to our knees, return to the true love of God, and the best way to do that is reminding ourselves of what the Word of God says, reviewing, renewing our confidence, repenting truly, and seeking God in truth and honesty for who he truly is. Chapter 4 talks about the reign of the Lord in Zion. Now, imagine God talking about the destruction and immediately after that, the next chapter is reign, the Lord's reign. Of course, we know that the Lord's reign comes after destruction. When the children of God went into captivity in Babylon. After destruction, those who remained through lamentations, you see they were so overwhelmed by so much destruction the Lord had done. They understood their sin and they repented and they went back in Babylon ready to serve God with all their heart and all their mind with all their soul. That's why we see so many people in the word of God who went, they were so powerful, they obeyed, they became a power to be called with in a foreign land. They influenced positively other nations because their God revealed his power through them to these nations and there was revival. So God's revived the children God revived the children of Israel in captivity after a great fall and a mighty fall in Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the Lord of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, he sh and we shall walk in his path. For out of Zion the Lord shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But anyone shall, everyone shall sit down, shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them feel afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken, for all people walk each in the name of his God, but he will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Uh, Zion's future triumph in that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jai of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has any, has your counselor perished? For pangas have seized you like a woman in labor, be in pain and labor to bring forth a daughter of Zion like a woman in bath pangs. 
For now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now also many nations have gathered against you who say, Let her be defiled, and let your eye look upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. For he will gather them like shells to the threshing floor. Arise and slash and shleth, O daughter of Zion, for I will make you horn iron, and I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples. I will consecrate their gain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. Brother and sister, following a great fall was a promise of restoration for Zion. And God mobilized this. We see this is a prophecy before the fall, but we have read the books of the fall before. We have read the book of Jeremiah. We have read the book of Lamentations. We know what exactly happened. We have seen what, uh, we've seen, read the book of, of, um, of Esther. We have read the book of Daniel. We see truly, indeed, what happened. We've read the book of Ezra. We've read the book of Nehemiah. Now we are reading the book of a prophecy that happened before. And we see these things really happened. A broken people, scattered, frustrated. But God mobilized them and made them a great nation. And they became a sneer. So the many nations that tried to stand against them. We know the case of Haman, how he had mobilized the people to destroy the Jews in the land and what God did through Esther and Mordecai. And we saw what God did to the enemies of the friends of Daniel. We have seen what God did to those who tried to throw Daniel to the den of lions. We have seen how God used his people mightily in the land of the Cherudins. So it's important to understand that when we see God speaking to us, especially those who have chosen him, he speaks uh, for us to return to him. He shows us the iniquity in our foundations that we may deal with it through repentance. And once we've fully repented and we're standing in a place to receive his blessing, then he begins, he, he speaks of the good and the bad. And sometimes if you're not well guided, you might think you're not making progress. But like he did, you see to the prophets, he talked of restoration, he talked of destruction, and then there were times within which people lived. So those who understand and told the times and seasons and took the word of God seriously, they knew how to repent for the sin and they knew how to claim for the prosperity that God was promising his people. He continues in chapter 5 to talk about the, the triumph. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of, of troops. He has laid such against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with the rod of the cheek, on the cheek. Uh, Mecca also talked about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, but, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, Though you are a little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock. In the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide for now, he shall be great to the ends of the earth. 
and this one shall be peace. Imagine on a day of Easter, God chooses that we read about a scripture like this. For me, God overwhelms me. Last Christmas, sorry, uh, as we are ushering into the new year during the festive season, I remember us reading the book of Kings. And it was a season as dealing with Jezebel. What a perfect way to end a year. Dealing with the devil and all his cohorts and the spirit of Jezebel. And now, in the season we are reminded of his sacrifice, of his death, I am reading about a promise of him coming, the Messiah, and his bold acts are reflected on the cross. And God says through Mika that though you are a little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. What I understand from this is that God is talking about one who lives forever coming onto the earth physically among his people to redeem them. That makes Jesus exclusively not man. But he became man because God has capacity to do anything and takes any form he chooses. And so he says in verse 3 that therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. We know that from the time the children of God were taken into Babylon, even when they returned, they returned as orphans. And that's what the word of God says, that we are given up for a time. But from the day Mary gave birth, there was a sign of hope in the whole of Judah. The, anxious, the anxiousness of waiting, the hope for the future. This is a very powerful scripture for the day like this. And so, it continues to talk about judgment on the enemies of Israel. Now listen to this. The children of God falling short of God's glory, falling out of covenant, being banished into Babylon, and now they are returned, and after upon restoration, there is a Messiah promised to them, and then there is the destruction of the enemies. Yes. We have fallen short of God's glory because of the sinfulness of our ancestors, which resulted into our own sins because some of the sins we had no control. We found ourselves falling short because of the legal right the enemy had against us, which right was given to them by our ancestors, but also in this case because they were ignorant. Their case was different. Our case as Africans is different. If you are a European and an American, when you pray, you pray differently because your ancestors were not ignorant. They were introduced to Christianity. They chose God. They loved him. They worshipped them. Then along the way, people got lost. So when you pray, you repent like Daniel repented because there, was a, there is a relationship that you built with God in your foundations that you destroyed. On the contrary, in Africa, we are still struggling with foundations. Since the introduction of Christianity, we are still struggling with our foundations. So all we need to do, we need to repent because we served other gods out of ignorance. We are like these children, the cherubites, whom we talked about in the book of Jeremiah chapter 35. Still struggling to find the almighty God. 
still struggling to get a foundation cleaned up. And yet for you, you already had your ancestors clean your foundation and along the way you get lost. So I would say that you people in Europe and America had found your way, entered into a covenant with God, but along the way you allowed to be uh, led back into sin by disobedience. And so for you, your case seems familiar to the case of the children of God being banished in Babylon. And so when you pray the prayer of Daniel in chap chapter 9 and Nehemiah chapter 9 as well, and uh, you will find that probably your battles will not be as hard as us because for us you are still struggling with foundations and yet for you, you had a good basis to begin from repenting, yes, but repent differently and return to the Lord that you found, the God that, that brought you to the place you are right now, the God that gave you the wisdom that you have, the great things that you do. I'm sure you didn't know how to do them until you found God. And so you need to remind yourselves and remind your, answer, your descendants that you are who you are because of the Lord Almighty. He's dwelt among you, but now because of uh, being taken up by the things of the world, you forgot your place. All you need to do is to return to your original love. And yet here us in Africa, we need to be able to fully find the Lord. Of course, as nations, but as individuals, there are also people who had great foundations. Those that received Christianity early and broke free but gave birth to children who returned to sin. So it's important as a nation to know how to pray but also as individuals. When you're interceding for the nation, you need to know how to repent. And so the children of God uh, go through so much there is, there is destruction of their land. Those who survive go into captivity. And out of captivity, God promises them triumph. And he returns them back to their land. And they come back, but still without so much power. And then during that time, God reveals the Messiah who is born among them. And also he destroys those who had been the enemies that rejoiced when they were captured and also those that supported the enemy. When the Assyrians came, come, 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 when the Assyrian comes into our land and when he treads on our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. They shall west with, with the sword in the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into the land, and he will trade within our borders. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people, like dew from the Lord, like the showers of the grass that tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men, and the remnant of the Lord shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of shepherd of sheep, who if he passes through both treads down and tears in pieces, and none can deliver, our hand shall be lifted against our adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off you, your horses from your midst. I'll destroy your chariots, I'll cut off the cities of your land, and throw down all your strongholds. I'll cut off sorceries, sorceries, sorceries from your land, and they shall have no soothsayers. Your caved images I will also cut off and your sacred pillars from your midst. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I'll pluck, I'll pluck your wood images 
from your midst. Thus I will destroy your cities and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. Um, the Lord also pleads with Israel. Chapter 6. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. You see, God makes these promises, but he requires that we must ask him to fulfill them. Pray. He's not just made these promises, but he's telling the children of God, pray. Plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear all, all you mountains, the Lord's complaints. And you strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I worried you? Testify against me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Miriam, sorry. O oh, my people, remember now that Barak, king of Moab, counsel and what Barak, king of Moab, counseled and what Barak, the son of Boa, answered him from Akasha Grove to Gilgal, that you may know that the righteousness of you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before high, the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? With the Lord, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of ram, ten thousand rivers of oil, of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? And having asked the children of God to, pl to pray while pleading with Israel, he now also prophesies of the punishment of Israel's injustice. You see, the word of God seems a little bit confusing, but if you try to relate it with your spiritual life, I'm sure that one morning you wake up with a good message, another morning you wake up. I mean, God works on us as a work in progress. He deals with evil in us. There is evil that has been. There is evil that comes against us. There is evil that is a going concern that we must be able to deal with as we go up. So he talks of restoration, he talks of the Messiah, he talks of uh, punishing our enemies, but he's also talking about punishing the injustice. And so he says, the Lord's voice cries to the city, wisdom shall see your name. Hear the Lord who has appointed it. Are there yet the treasures of the wickedness in the house of the wicked? And the short measure that is an abomination, shall I count pure those with the wicked scales and with the bag of deceitful weights? For her rich men are full of violence, and her inhabitants have spoken lies. And their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore I also make you sick by striking you, by making you desolate because of your sins, you shall eat, but not be satisfied. Hunger shall be in your midst. You will carry some away, but shall not save them. But what you do, rescue, I will give over to the sword. You shall sow, but not reap. You shall trade the olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. And make sweet wine, but not drink wine. For the statutes of Omri are kept. All the works of Ahab's house are done, and you walk in their counsels. 
that I may make you a desolation and your inhabitants a hissing. Therefore, you shall bear the reproach of my people. So having told the children of God the great news of the Messiah and the restoration, now he tells them, you are going to be punished for your sin. Why is he telling this? He's reminding them why they must return to him. And had the children of God heeded the advice of Micah, they wouldn't have gone into destruction because Micah presented their case, what would become if they sinned. But nonetheless, he talked of restoration and the Messiah. So those few who among them understood the word of God and waited upon him and did as Micah had advised, are most probable the ones who went into captivity and the ones that returned mightily and revealed the power of the Lord in captivity. Finally, the last chapter is chapter 7. It talks about sorrow for Israel's sin. Woe to me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes, there is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. That they may successfully do evil with both hands, the prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe and the great man utters his evil desire. So they scheme together the best of them is like a bear, a prayer. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth for her who lies in your bosom, for son dishonors father, daughter arises, rises against mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his household. Therefore, I will look for, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Praise God. It's important to read the word of God. However, if you do not read the word of God, be ready to be misled. As I was reading this scripture, God reminded me in 2015, uh, I was, of course, a child of God. I loved God. I loved to pray, but I didn't know how to read the Bible. So someone read the Bible for me, and uh, as they were encouraging me, they read scriptures for me, and they read for me this scripture, verse... Um, Verse 6, which says that the enemies, your worst enemies, are the end members of your household. And I know there are so many people who think that the members of the household are their enemies. But what the word of God is telling us, understanding the context, is that we need to be alert and watch over. Because the enemy is going to use every available vessel against us including our family members if they are available to be used and so you a child of god will know when the devil is coming up against you and you will be able to tell that this is the devil and you will be able to undress him you will take all your relatives your family members under the blood of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse them, and they will be ungarmented of the evil power, and the devil will not have access to you. I have seen this in my spiritual realm. When the enemy wants to attack me, he comes disguised as my relative. I thank God who gave me that revelation that every relative of mine in my spiritual realm have covered in the blood of Jesus, that even when the devil tries to use them, I can tell in my dream that this is the devil camouflaging and I ask, I attack him. Because ultimately, God gave me family because he knows that I needed it. 
He's given me brothers and sisters. He's given me children he's, and nieces and nephews. He's given me parents. He's given me uncles and aunties. And those are my family. And no amount of evil from the pit of hell will continue to succeed in dividing us that way. At least that I know that. And I thank God that I got to know. But in 2015, yes, because someone had misinterpreted the scripture for me when I had a dream and I saw my sister attacking me, I took it literally that she was the one attacking me. Today, when you seek God deeper and ask him to reveal that enemy that is hovering behind your sister, you will be shocked. That enemy hovering behind your uncle, that enemy coming under the guise of your auntie, your parents, it's the enemy from the pit of hell that deserves no right to gain access to your loved ones. It's your duty to intercede for your family. If you cannot love your brother and sister, you cannot love anybody else. You cannot love God when you cannot love your uncle and auntie. When Abraham, his son was ready to get married, he sent his servant to go back to his father's house to find a wife for him. Family is family. God gave it to us because he knows that we deserve it. Even though in your family you have people that the devil has turned into sorcerers and witches and priests on the altars of our ancestors, it is godly to love these people because love will defeat hate. And when it defeats hate, the devil will have no access to you. God requires that we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. How are you able to love a neighbor whom you see the devil using against you in form of every power? I strongly believe that he that is in me is stronger than he that is in the world. Can you be able to ungarment those people and get them in a place where they can join you in salvation? Or you're going to be born again and segregate these people and when you segregate them, they will know that your God is like their God. Because our God as power, he defeats every power. He stands against every principality and against every authority. I hope that has come out the way it ought to come out because we don't need to be deceived. Let us read the word of God. Confessions, Israel's confessions and comfort. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. And yes, brethren, there are those who sit and rejoice because God's people have fallen. You are going to be surprised. Because one who knows their God in truth, even though they fall through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be their God. Don't rejoice when you see men of God going through tribulations unless they have forgotten their God. But if they continue to know their God and seek him, the tables will turn. The Lord says they will fall, but they will rise. That's what the word says. When I fall, I will rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. So he knows that there will be a time when the children of God will miss a step and they will pay the price. But those who stay strong in the Lord, I feel sorry for people who despise the church. I feel sorry for the people who despise men whom God has used. And you hear them saying, ah, those people have fallen short of God's glory. God knows. And in their closet, they must return to God and say, God, you know, this has been my point of weakness. Help me through this and I will not fail you again. It is exactly this case of, um, uh, I've forgotten this. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, this man. Mm hmm. I wanted to give you an example of this uh, great uh, Samson. Samson 
having fallen short and being captured and his eyes brought out after he fell to the trap of Dilera. Uh, when he was in prison and his hair started to grow again, given a chance, he asked God, give me one that chance and I'll avenge for my eyes. And so God still used him and on his day when he died, he died with so many people that he had never killed in all his lifetime. So do not despise God's people. Do not celebrate when you see them going through tribulations, unless really they have truly fallen. But if they haven't, God is going to overwhelm you with what he can do for their sake. And so the word of God tells us that when they fall, they rise. And when they sit in darkness, the Lord will be their light. Be careful with people who God has chosen to be their light. And even you yourself, you know, you've walked through the valley of the shadow of death and God has been with you. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he bleeds my case and executes justice for me, he will bring me forth to the light. I will seek his righteousness. Then she, she who is my enemy will see and shame will cover her who said to me, where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like a mud in the streets. In the days when your walls are to be built, in that day the decree shall go far and wide. In that day they shall come to you from Assyria and the fortified cities, from the, forti fort from the fortress to the river, from sea to sea and mountain to mountain. Yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds. You see, he acknowledges that he is going through the he is bearing the indignation of the Lord because he had sinned against him. But as he's going through the indignation, he's returning to God, he's repenting. It is so strange how we love to judge people because of the moment, but we do not know the journey they are walking. May God teach us to be helpers of our loved ones. We should be able to hold the people when they are falling because we do not know why they are going through that. Be careful when you are dealing with people that have fallen before you. If you've not fallen before, don't rejoice yet. The person that is falling before you is taking the lead because when they will be rising, they'll be falling. That's what happened when the children of Israel were being taken into captivity. For the children of Judah, when Nebuchadnezzar came against them, nations around them celebrated. But as soon as God was ready to redeem the children and their returning home, he was scattering the nations that were rejoicing. So be careful. When you see people going down, sympathize and support them in prayer and intercession. When you see sick people, if you can, pray for them. Because on your sick day, what can save you most are the prayers of your loved ones. Because in most cases, you're not even able to pray. You're not strong to pray on your own. But when you see people sick and you start writing them off, <laughs> What will you do when it's your turn and they have recovered? It's important to stand with those who are weak because at the point of their weakness, they need your prayers more. Because we're all going to fall sick one day, we are going to die. We're all going to go through financial limitations. I can tell you, if you do not see the hand of God in your finances, prepare for that day. The tables can turn. If you're earning some money today, serve God more with that money and trust him to keep it longer than you. But if you think you have some money and you think that's all, you don't need God. My dear, what is coming right ahead of you 
you need to prepare for it. And so, God will forgive Israel, shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, who dwell, who dwell solitarily in a woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gered, as in, the, in days of old. As in the days when you come out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. The nations shall, shall see be shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth, their ears shall be deaf, they shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth, they shall be afraid of the Lord our God, and shall fear the fear because of you who is like. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever. Because he delights in the mercy, in mercy, he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquity. You will cast our all our sins into the depth of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sown to our fathers from days of old. Brothers and sisters, I had never fallen in love with the book of Nika like I have done today. My understanding of the word of God changes each time I revisit it. And that has put me in a place of confidence and trust that my God who started this work, he surely will finish it. As we go into the day of the resurrection, I pray that God will teach us the sole purpose of our salvation and we shall renew our covenant with God and we shall repent of our sins and we shall stop taking our God for granted and honor him in truth and honesty. It's been a great day today, a great sharing, a great reading. Until tomorrow when we meet again to, to be uh, blessed by the word of God, I pray that you've been blessed. I wish you an amazing Easter. Until tomorrow, may God bless you. Have a good night and bye-bye.